class. Mr. Watlington, this is week two. We're going into workshop two of our CIS 227 hardware software troubleshooting. And I think everybody had a pretty good week one, which is great. Week two, we're going to be talking about operating systems. And this is a uh, Hopefully, it'll give you a little more insight into operating systems and how operating systems work. Some of the things we're going to cover this week when we look at the outcomes, we're going to compare and contrast uh, operating system types and their purposes. Also, we're going to, as always, apply some biblical and ethical uh, principles. And I love you guys' comments back on the um, other women of the Bible, the devotionals that I put in there. Keep, keep the comments coming. We, we love those. Also, uh, some of the things you're going to cover is how to install and support Windows, the Windows operating system, as well as we're going to look at the Mac OS, Linux, and mobile operating systems. And then we're going to get into talking about how you managing manage files and storage devices. Some of the labs this week, you're going to be uh, virtually, yeah, installing Windows 10, how to use backup and restore. Uh, looking at virtual machine, there's a virtual machine lab as well as a Mac OS and a Linux lab. All right, so let's talk about operating systems. So when we talk about operating systems, uh, let's th and, and what is that operating system? It's really the interface between the user and the computer. Well, I know we got into this some last week uh, at, during week one, during my, during my week one video, but really we, what you got? You got hardware, we'll start at the bottom. Yeah, and we talked about the hardware. That operating system sits right on top of the hardware. You have applications that then are installed on the operating system. And then as users, we are the ones as users. Uh, we use applications installed in operating systems and hardware. So when we think about an operating system, we talked about this before. This is just a quick review from last week to, get, to kind of get a running start into this one. Really at the heart of any operating system is the kernel. Like I said, what that kernel does is it manages your input output requests from software. It translates those into instructions that your CPU can understand and process. On the outside of that kernel, that's where we have APIs or device drivers. And what this does, it allows the kernel to be able to talk to uh, higher level applications and uh, user applications. And like I said, on top of that, then we have operating system applications. And we talked about that. Uh, things like file manager, control panel, your print screen, um, uh, uh, device setup, and all those different things. Those are all operating system applications, not to be confused with user applications. And like I said, here's just an example. Uh, when you kind of look at file manager, the different things you can do within file manager. That is an operating system application. Also within this area, this is also where we have our command line interface. Uh, if, if, if we're talking about things like Windows PowerShell or Linux uh, Bash, which is the <coughs> excuse me the, the the shell that's used with Linux, and there's there are, there are multiple shells um, that's that's used in this in the Linux environment. Then, like I said, and this is not part of the operating system, but this is where your user applications reside. They are installed on the operating system. But these three layers, the uh, kernel, the device drivers, and the operating system apps, that's what makes up an operating system. So when we look at this kernel, like I say, really, that is the heart and core of your operating system. That's what connects your application software to the hardware of the computer. That's what does that function for you. Like I say, and it is. Um, it's, a, it's a fundamental part of, of any modern, modern computer system. And that kernel is talking to the CPU. The kernel is talking to your memory. It's like your RAM. It also is talking to devices. So you're talking to those hardware components as well as the kernel is interfacing with those applications, with your user applications as well as operating system applications. Okay, so when we think about an operating system, um, what are some of the functions that an operating system do? Uh, so I, I group these into really five areas. So an operating system, an OS, those are programs used to manage and control, like I say, the CPU, your, your, your central processing unit. It also controls your networking piece, like I say, the, your NIC, your network interface card. It controls that. It controls your IOs, whether, like, whether it's 
uh, USB ports or the HDMI display port, whatever types of I.O. devices that you have. Um, keyboards, it controls those things as well. And it controls files. Really, this is the hard drive. This is where it's, it goes back and forth and brings things <clears throat> from your hard drive um, back and forth. Oh, last piece, I'm sorry. And memory. It also controls your RAM, your, your memory. So you see that these programs within this operating system, it is constantly reaching out, talking to these different components within your computing system. So when we think about operating systems, really three different families you know, of operating. Now I will tell you, there are more operating systems than these. There are embedded operating systems. Um, there are operating systems that operate you know, with um, in, in industrial systems that are solely built to do that one function, you know, working with um, industrial control systems and things like that. But for uh, normal users, we interface typically day to day either with Windows, Mac, or Linux. And we're gonna kind of walk through these uh, just a little bit, those three basic core operating systems. When we think about Windows, I don't know if you can see this well or not, but I'm gonna attach the PowerPoint slides. But this gives you a, a walk down memory lane of Windows, going all the way back to Windows 1. Windows 1, this is in 1985. I know some of you guys weren't even born in 1985. But yeah, 1985, this was the first version of Windows. And if you look, it looks pretty, uh, um, I would say archaic, but uh, almost looks like what I see when I, I see you know, kids watching anime. <laughs> it looks about the same. But it, like I said, it has some menus, it has some scroll bars, it has some things like that. Went to Windows 2 and 87, looks a little bit better. Got to Windows 3 in uh, 1990 um, and, and really, Computing, personal computing was just starting to catch on through this, this area. We, it didn't really start to become prime time till we hit Windows 3.1 and later Windows 95. Windows 95, like that's when it had the start button uh, was introduced. And built in internet support, they built that right in. Like I said, this is, during this time, this is when we have things like fax machines and, and modems, you know, those modems, you've got mail. Yeah, those kinds of modems were connected. Uh, the Windows 98 made a few changes. The next big leak really was Windows XP. Uh, I know some of you probably may or may not remember Windows XP, but that was a, a fundamental uh, shift with Windows. Like I said, this was the first OS, Microsoft, Microsoft operating system, designed to work with large amounts of me memory and projects. Up until that point, like said, it was really hard for Windows to uh, acquisition or see if you had a lot of, a lot of memory. It could only, you can only look at so many, so much memory location. So Windows XP really kind of came on the scene and, and, and start to change the Windows environment. Then we went to Windows 7, Windows 8. Now Windows 8 was <clears throat> really kind of took us into that mobile arena uh, with um, with their their uh, touch pads and things like that. With, that's when they went to that tiles, you know, those tiles. Uh, Windows 8.1, and that takes us up to where we are today with Windows 10. Windows 10. So that kind of gives you a walk through where we've gone through with Windows. Now with Windows, there are some advantages and disadvantages. Some of the advantages of Windows, uh, well, I'd say one, it's, it's, it is pretty, it's easy to use. Why? Because it's a, it's a commonly known operating system across really the world now. It also, it, uh, it uh, easy to update. They push, you know, Windows updates, you know, Patch Tuesday comes out and they're constantly making updates to Windows. It's supported. Yes, you got, you know, a support structure there within the Microsoft environment. So those are some advantages as well as if you like gaming. If you're a gamer, you know, the Windows platform supports gaming pretty well and it's familiar. Why? Yeah, everybody knows it. We're aware of Windows and we, we, we know how to uh, navigate through Windows. Some of, the, some of the disadvantages, now I will tell you, as I go through these advantages and disadvantages, you know, I, you can go either way. But this is kind of a broad gen, gen, general category. What may be an advantage for you may be a disadvantage for me. So but when we look at some of the things that may be disadvantages, um, it is a little, it's a pricey. It's a little, a little expensive. It can be, you know, to, and, and I will tell you the prices, you know, have dropped somewhat because they're trying to push everybody to the Windows 365 and get you to do a subscription, you know, and that way you're paying them every month so you don't feel like you're paying a lot of money. I'm only paying, you know, $11.95 a month. That's not too bad until you do the math. So, you know, that's one of the things that can be a little pricey. 
Uh, there are some security features. They've gotten better. But there were sometimes some security features within Windows um, out of the box that could have been improved and stability, like I say, because uh, Windows tried to operate across multiple platforms. It doesn't matter what type of hardware you buy. You know, it could be a, a Asus machine, it could be a Dell, it could be uh, multiple different types, it could be an AMD processor or an Intel processor. So Windows is written to try to operate across all of these different platforms. And with to do that, they have to make a lot of interfaces, different types of interfaces, which sometimes lead to it leading to Windows not being as stable uh, as, it, as it could be. Okay, let's look at Mac, the Mac OS. This is an early version of Mac. Here again, looks pretty cheesy, doesn't it? Looks pretty cheesy, but uh, that was one of the early versions. This is the current version, but I will tell you, Mac is kind of well known for this, this graphical user interface, this, the GUI, as we call it. And, and really Steve Jobs, he was one of the first ones to come out to shoot with this graphical user interface and how to um, navigate around uh, your, your desktop in a in a graphical fashion, but actually we came, we've come quite a bit of ways. So I say, really, January 24th, 1984. That's when Apple introduced the Macintosh. Macintosh again, 1984. That's quite a while ago. Um, and I say it was that Macintosh. Is, it was credited with really popularizing the, this GUI, that graphical user interface. If we look at some of the the newer versions of the Mac, they operate with a uh, um, their OS operate what we call a hybrid kernel, a kernel that does multifunction. For this class, we're not going to dig too deeply into that, but uh, there's different types of kernels. We've talked about the kernel before, but there's a uh, monolithic kernel and then there's a hybrid uh, kernel. And, and those two kernels are able to do different things uh, based on the, the requirement of what you need them to do. Now, some of the advantages of the Mac, just like we compare it to Windows, Windows one, let's take a look at that. Uh, GUI, yes, it has a very usable, you know, the, the graphical user interface because it was built uh, for, for, for graphics. It was built, um, you know, from, from the Macintosh early on. It also, like I say, it's, it has a better graphics uh, capability for designers. If, you know, if you go to most people who do any type of creative things, such as whether it's music production, uh, uh, video production, things of that nature, they, they kind of levitate toward the Mac because the interfaces are so seamless. Like I said, I'm a Mac guy myself, and yeah, but the interfaces, everything interfaces together. Um, security, like I said, there is, because it operates on a Unix core, uh, Unix uh, type of background, it makes it a little bit easier to provide security when you have multi-users uh, in that environment. So, so there are some security um, advantages. I will tell you this, early on, yeah, there was a, a, a distinctive difference between the, the, the Mac world and the Windows world with, with security. However, today, you know, those two worlds have come a lot closer together. And stable, yes, and why is it more stable? Because the Mac OS is written specifically for Mac hardware. So the two are extrically linked together. So you're not having an operating system that you're trying to run on multiple different types of hardware and you have to write all of these interfaces or APIs to be able to interface with these different pieces of hardware. The Mac OS and the Mac hardware are built to work with each other. And without a lot of modifications, I mean, it can be done. You can't just grab Mac OS and run it on a different machine. It is made to run on a Mac which again, makes it quite stable. Now, some of the disadvantages of the Mac OS, <clears throat> it really doesn't support gaming very, very well. If you're a gamer, uh, the Mac OS is probably not the operating system for you if you are a gamer. Also, um, you, you know, there's a lot of third party software that isn't built to run on the Mac platform. And the reason why, it goes back to that stability. You know, before Mac will allow something to run, they wanna be sure that that software is gonna be stable. So that's one of the reasons a lot of times you can't get you know, your favorite software in a Mac version. Also, uh, some people don't like the mouse. Why? Because you know, they really simplify that mouse, especially you know, the, the, the new mouse. It doesn't even have a click button. It just has one click and it has swipe and it has a lot of tactical um, um, interfaces on that mouse. So some people have problems with, with relearning uh, the mechanics of the mouse and the keyboard because certain things are in different places. And initially it can be expensive. Now I will say, you know, even though I have this up here as a disadvantage, 
as a as a longtime Mac user, I will tell you to me this is actually advantage. And it, why? Because I'm not replacing my Macs on the same cycle I was with my Windows machine. Um, as a matter of fact, I, we just upgraded, but before that, we had it, our Mac for 10, 12, almost 13, because it was it remained uh, operable up until that point. So. It may seem expensive up front, but over the long haul. But however, you know, I'm not trying to sell you on Mac or, or, or Windows or anything, but just with some of the advantages or disadvantages. All right, let's take a look at Linux. Linux. Uh, Linux. Actually, what that is, it's a graphical term that means Unix-like. It is not Unix. It's Unix-like. And uh, it is based on a, G, on a GUI as well, a graphical user interface. Now, how did it come about? Uh, going back to here again, a little history. Uh, a little history lesson, I know. In September 1991, Linus Travolz, he was a second year uh, student at the uh, University of Helsinki, okay? And that's where he developed a preliminary kernel, that, that Linux kernel, and that was version 0.0.1. Now, Linux is open source, which means that most of the distribution for Linux is free. You don't have to buy it. It's readily available, okay? And uh, it's, it's able to run the program, for, and, and with that, you can use it for whatever you want. So you don't really get into a lot of licensing issues like you do with Mac OS, Windows OS, where certain things you can and cannot, you know, because you have this EULA, this end user licensing, licensing agreement. But, you know, buying, buying Linux is like buying a, I, I, I compare it to buying a, 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 a car, okay? It's the same type of licensing. If you go buy a brand new Mustang off the lot, right, Ford Mustang, you can take that Mustang home and you can do pretty much whatever you want to with it. If you can make it fit, you can take the engine out of that Mustang and put a, a Chevrolet Camaro engine in there and a Oldsmobile transmission. And Ford is not gonna come looking to you and go, hey, what did you just do to our car? Because th that vehicle has, an, has a, um, a type of open source license that once you buy it, they, you know, they, they can't say you can't make these changes and modifications. Now, I will say, since uh, they're using more and more software and operating systems in your car, now some of those things with the, with the software and the OS, uh, you know, like say for your, your radio, your dashboard, everything that controls that, that big screen in a lot of cars now, there are some proprietary things on that software, but the car overall, you can change it, you can cut it in half, and you can weld the back end of a Nissan truck on the back of it. Nobody cares. This is similar to an open source license with Linux. You can take a Linux kernel, pretty much do what you want to with it. You can add your own applications and your own interfaces and make it do what you want to do, and you won't get into any type of uh, end user licensing agreement problems. Then after you do that, you can also share the program with other people. And the way Linux works is that, that you know, and that's why some people like Linux is because the community improves the program. Not just, there's not just one place like, you know, Microsoft or, or Apple that's working on that software. It's a community effort. So there's some of the advantages uh, when we look at with Linux. Yeah, free. Free is always a good an advantage. You can never go wrong with free. Uh, another thing, now, I will say, there are versions of Linux that are not free. Like if you get into some of the Red Hat, some of the different ones that you may have to pay. But overall, it's free. Stable, is it stable? Well, yes, here's why. Because Linux is, there's a community of people that work on Linux. So whenever there's a problem that's found, somebody in the community go, hey, we found a problem here and I found the fix for it. And they will post it out there on that uh, community page and, and the problem gets fixed quite quickly. So it's a, it's a pretty stable platform. Secure, yes, just because it is Unix-like, there are those same security uh, things built in. The uh, source code, what does that mean? Yeah, the, like I said before, the, you can have the source code. There's no secret sauce. If you go ask um, Microsoft, hey, I want the source code for Windows 10, they're gonna look at you like you're crazy. You need to get out of here. You go to a uh, Ubuntu website, you can get the source code and you can build your own, um, or, or a Debian, I should say. And then you can build your own Linux distribution from that. Low PC requirements. 
Well, that means it's a it's lightweight. If you hear this term, we're talking about lightweight. It's a lightweight operating system. It it doesn't take a lot of memory. It doesn't take a lot of uh, um, disk space. Uh, all of these things to, to, for that operating system to run. And that's why people love Linux because now I can take that Linux core and I can put it into a Roku TV and it works because it's very lightweight. I can get, all I get is what I need. I don't have to buy the whole uh, enchilada, or the whole package of everything together. Like I would if I wanted to run it off of Windows or I wanted to run it off a of Mac OS. They're gonna sell me everything when all I want is this piece right here. Uh, some of the disadvantages of Linux. Yes, there are disadvantages, quite a few for some people. Again, you know, um, you may have to work hard to find a distribution that will run the software, third-party software. So if you've got some Windows applications you want to run, or you may have to use uh, some, some tools like Wine and some others that will help you run third-party software. And that gets a little, a little clumsy if you're not uh, a savvy Linux person. Uh, not supported. Some people don't like the fact that it's community supported. You know, if you if you're Mac, uh, um, a Windows or or a Mac OS, you can call those guys. They've got a support desk. A lot of times, I'm you know the service you get may be a little suspect, but they do have a support desk you can call. Whereas with Linux, like I say, it is a community effort. You go out and there are there are Linux groups. You know that. That, you know, basically like a wiki page, and you can find the support you need. But there's not a Linux help desk that's going to, boom, here you go. Here's Ubuntu help desk, and we're going to solve your problems for you. Uh, so also, it is a operating system that you have to learn to use to become a little skilled at to install and to operate. Then you have to install packages, get the right distribution. There are steps you have to do. Uh, because it, this is really made for people who understand the operating system and the environment. Uh, when we think about servers, okay, like I say, those were operating systems that really work on workstations. Now, servers, like there are, there they have their own operating systems, and like I say, server uh, server operating systems are designed to provide platforms for multi users or for critical network applications. You know, say like a print server or email server. That email server is sitting there providing everybody in your office with email services or a print server where you have a, you know, one printer goes to a server uh, and it spools and lets 50 people be able to print to that one printer and do it effectively. Uh, <clears throat> I can see, and really, when we start talking security, stability, collaboration, that is really the core behind server operating systems. It's many times, like I say, when we think about uh, server OSs, it's dedicated to some type of, of specific function. Well, it could be a web server, uh, email server agent, it could be you know, terminal services. Uh, like I say, here's some of the common types of OSs. You know, like I say, file and print ser uh, uh, sharing. Uh, applications, um, actually websites, all of those things would run on a server. The great thing about a server is that, yes, multiple people can, can access it, uh, information on a server at the same time. Unlike, let's say you have a share drive. If you have a share drive, everyone can't go in and update or uh, a document on a share drive at the same time. So that's what a server is good for. Now, these are some different types of servers. That's all different types, but some of the um, um, popular ones that you will see is Windows, you know, like I say the Windows uh, 2016 server, Linux, like I say Red Hat, this is a very, very popular server uh, OS, Red Hat. <clears throat> uh, Solaris, like I say there's Mac has its own server. So that's quite a few different uh, types of servers out there. Another type of operating system to be aware of is what we call mobile. Mobile operating system. That's an operating system that controls a mobile device. Many types of mobile operating system. One that you see a lot is Symbian. Like I say, the, the Symbian, like I say, that's the operating system that ran your Nokia phones, uh, Samsung phones. You've got your I, uh, iPhone OS, as well as, I don't know if they're still around very big, but back in the day, uh, Blackberry, you know, RIM. Uh, research in motion, that's what REM stood for. But yeah, but that will tell you, this was probably one of the, a very stable um, operating system for, for a mobile operating system. Windows, they gave, they, you know, they're still playing around with trying to become you know, a, a mobile uh, operating system you know, where they, <clears throat> with the Surface and with the tablets and, and the ad operating system, they had to kind of step back because um, their first uh, 
out to shoot with Windows 8, 8.1. They tried to use kind of that same operating system on your desktop that you use on your on your uh, laptop and your Surface devices, and and the phone. You remember the, the Windows phone? So and there was just issues with that. So Windows has had to step back and kind of regroup in the mobile operating system. Linux, yes. And now what you see with Linux many times, you won't see it as a separate operating system. But Linux is running in the background on a lot of these other platforms. One you don't hear about anymore is Palm. If you remember the, the Palm Pilot. But Palm, now this by far was probably one of the best mobile operating systems out there as far as being stable, as far as being able to operate and, 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 and to integrate the Palm uh, applications. And a big one out there now is the Android. So if you look across there now, really the big, the big name players really is, you know, Apple, Android, and your Windows. You know, those are, are really the big name players and when it comes to mobile operating systems. Okay, let's switch gears from operating systems to storage and media devices. Remember one of the key things that your operating system does is that it controls the media, it controls storage, it controls um, your, your hard drive, where, where your data is stored. Now, different types of storage media. We have optical drives, things like your CD-ROMs, DVD, Blu-ray, all of those, all of those are optical disc. Uh, then we got uh, hard disk drives, and, and we still use those, even though we're moving slowly away from hard disk drives to flash or SSDs, you know, your solid state devices, solid state drives. Now with a, with a hard disk drive, I'd say that is really using, a, it's, it's a mag, magnetic media. When we talk about hard drive, things are stay, saved magnetically on a, on a platter. Uh, the flash drives, this is just a semiconductors. You know, it's, it's, it's a uh, uh, type of a transistor, a, a junction that, that actually s saves information. And, it, and it's able, unlike RAM, uh, when we talk about storage media, it's actually able to save that even after the power is turned off. And we are still using magnetic tape, just to let you know. Low cost solution for long term data storage. So yeah, there are still magnetic tapes. So when we're archiving information, many times we can put that on a magnetic tape and we can store it away for the next five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. So when we talk about storage, like I say hard drives and, and HDDs, this is still probably the most, still the most prevalent, even though, yeah, we're moving away from these and going to SSDs, but SSDs are still a little costly, a little expensive right now. But so, so when we think about hard drives, what it is, like I say, that is a, a, a rapidly rotating disc or called a platter that's um, coated with a magnetic material. <clears throat> And, and, when we, and the reason we call it a hard disk, why? Is because it's rigid. The disk itself is hard. Back, back, way back in the day when I bought my first computer, we used floppy disk, meaning that it was magnetic, but it was a piece of like mylar plastic and it was, it was soft, you could bend it. Now, within these drives now, those are hard disk surface, uh, surfaces. So to give you a sneak a sneak peek under the hood of how operating, I mean, uh, well, operating systems, how uh, hard drives can work. If you look inside of a hard drive, this is kind of what you're gonna see, right? You're gonna have a spindle, a cylinder, and you're gonna have multiple platters uh, uh, within that hard drive. And this is connected to a, a motor, and that motor is spinning. And that motor is, could be spinning anywhere from 750 RPM, uh, 550 RPMs, it could be 1,400 uh, <clears throat> RPMs. So it just depends on how fast it spins. Now, what happens on this platter? So this is, you know, actually this is a kind of a diagonal look at these platters. Let's take a, a top-down look at this platter. So when you format a disc, what are you actually doing? Well, what it does, if we take a look at this whole platter, it breaks it up into tracks and sectors. Now what a track is, if you look all the way around, so track, and then another track on the inside, another track on the inside. Sectors, that's these little slices. So if I draw these lines here and here and here and there and there, now each one of these is a sector, okay? So that right there, that uh, sector, that's a, a sector, that's a sector, sector. So that's how your heart, when you format a hard drive, that's how it's uh, the operating system. It's the operating system that does this. 
it formats it. And basically it's like a, it's like a warehouse. It's it, with a bunch of, say if you had a warehouse, empty warehouse, and you're gonna start storing things. You bring some bunch of shelves in, right? So for now, on each of the shelves, you're gonna you know, build out these shelves and you're gonna label each shelf, you know? This is row one, um, I'm sorry, this is aisle one, row one, shelf one. Aisle one, row one, shelf two. And you would label everything. So that way, when you start putting things on the shelf, you could manage a little spreadsheet to know where things are. So, okay, you want a, what do you want? You want a, uh, a carburetor, okay. Okay, you need to go to aisle two, row one, uh, shelf three. Well, that's what your operating system does when you format a hard drive. It basically catalogs each of these, each of these sectors, right? Each of these sectors. It, 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 uh, it formats it and it catalogs them. So now when you, it, you need to write data, it says, okay, write you know, part of it here. You're gonna write part of it here. Here's an empty one over here, the empty one over here. And it catalogs that. So now when you wanna retrieve that file off of uh, that hard drive, it knows where to go look for it. Okay, go to sector 1A, 4B, and 4C. Boom, there's the data. And it puts it back together and, and it uh, you know, saves a document, whatever, and it populates. So that is, in, a, in, in essence, how data is stored on a hard drive. Now on a SSD, works completely different. This thing doesn't spin, there's nothing, there's no moving parts, it's all electric, electronic switches. That's an on or off. And once those positions are set, even if you turn power off, it's gonna maintain that state. Since so now I go back and read it, and I know what, 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 what is on, what is off, what is on, what is off, and that's how it stores data. So talking about storing data, there are two basic methods of storing data. What we call file level storage and block level storage. Now, for most of your home applications, you know, whether it's on your um, home computer, or if let's say it's just, if you have a, a um, network attached storage or a USB storage device, it is storing everything at what we call a file level. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive, simple to use. Like I said, it stores files and folders. It breaks everything up into files and, fo and folders so it makes it easy for you to go back and find. <clears throat> if you are talking larger scale, like uh, internet. Let's say if you're saving things on, on, on in the cloud, then you the, your cloud provider, like um, Google, your Google Drive, that cloud provider, many times, are they're the, using that block storage. And with block storage, what it's doing is saving things in much larger blocks, not in files, but in larger blocks, and then, it, then when, it, when you retrieve it, it can put it back into a file format. But by saving in blocks, what it makes it easier to do is now if I need to move uh, data from one place to another, I can, I can move it across the internet or I can move it across fiber in large blocks as opposed to a lot of individual files. Uh, if you've, actually this week you're gonna be working with the virtual machines, VMware. Uh, so that's what it does. It saves things in blocks, in a block uh, level storage. File level storage, block level storage. Now when we're talking about file system type, there are many, many types of file systems. Some of these you may be familiar with already, some of them you may not. You know, and this is not all of them, this is just some of the common ones that you're gonna see. But really, that, this, these file systems, this is what actually manages the files as well as the metadata. If you haven't heard that term metadata before, meta <coughs> data means data about data. So it, it, it keeps all that uh, database information about the data that's on the disk. It's kind of like your warehouse. Your database that you just made for that warehouse we just built, that is metadata because it knows all the aisles, the rows, and the shelving. So that is data about your, your data. So, but yeah, so your file system really is what controls that metadata. And that's what actually does that writing and, and formatting your hard drive so that your, your, your drive is ready to accept information and it knows how to go back and find it. Some of the different types, we got FAT, you know, you can back see FAT, uh, FAT32, there's different variations of this. But you don't, actually, this was one of the earlier 
the file allocation table for uh, uh, types of file systems. Uh, UFS, if you were operating in the Unix world, you may see UFS, which is a Unix file system. Uh, NTFS, now this is what you see a lot today, we call a new technology file system, NTFS. That is a proprietary file system developed by Microsoft, uh, and it supports your Windows operating system. If you're working in the VM world with virtual machines, we've got uh, virtual machine file system, you know, VMFS. Uh, the, actually, this is those VMware clusters, and you may get exposed to that a little bit. Probably not in this class. There's other higher-level classes that will get more into that. Now, and the other one to be aware of is NFS. We use this quite a bit. This is your network file system. That is, like I say, so if you have a, a network-attached storage device, and you've got a, a, a Buffalo or, or, or some other type of, of storage device that's external of your computer, and it's connected to your, your network, then this is the file system that is used to be able to transfer things from your computer to that file system, uh, and to, I mean, to that storage device. And the good thing about NTFS is that it is able to operate across multiple types of operating systems. It can operate so that you can save Windows documents, you can save Linux documents, you can save Microsoft, I mean, um, um, Mac OS documents all on that external network attached storage device because NFS doesn't care. So it is able to write any of those uh, to that device. So those are your different types of file systems. All right, so let's wrap this up. Like I say, guys, uh, in summary, what did we talk about today? We looked at uh, your different operating system components, different, uh, the things that that operating system does, the kernel, uh, the uh, operating system application, the APIs, the device drivers, the different things, the functions of that operating system, what it controls, you know, things like your, your hard drive storage, uh, memory, it controls your CPU, also your, your input output devices, networking, your, your, your NIC, your networking cards, and all those different things that it supports. We looked at storage devices, you know, hard drives, uh, uh, as well as we talked briefly about SSDs, you know, your solid state drives, uh, flash drives, and then we ended up talking about file systems, the different types of file systems, and how your operating system interacts with that file system, because really it's your OS that controls how files are written onto storage devices. All right, guys. I hope that help you out and give you a little bit deeper understanding and appreciation for operating systems. Have a great week, week two. Uh, if you have questions, I always say, you know, please reach out, contact us, and we will uh, work with you in whatever method we can. All right, God bless you. Take care.